My name is Renee Clark, and this lecture is over Chapter 10 of the Think Python eBook. Lists are a sequence of values. In a string, the values are characters. In a list, they can be any type. So the values in a list are called elements or sometimes items. There are several ways to create a new list. The simplest is to enclose the elements in square brackets. Here we have an example where we are showing integers and we have a list of four integers. The output is the four integers. Here we have a list of strings and that output is also just a list of individual elements. They are all three strings. Now elements of a list do not have to have the same type. Here we have a list of strings, floats, integers, and another list. And you can see that the first item is string, and which is a string. The second item is a float. Third item is an integer. Fourth item is another list of two integers. And the fifth item is true, a Boolean. Now when you nest, have a list within a list, this is nesting. You can also have an empty list, which is just simply square brackets. You can assign values to variables. So here I'm creating three variables. Each of them are lists. And when we print those three variables, we get the three different lists, one of which is a set of strings, the next a set of integers, and the last is an empty list. Lists are mutable, meaning they can be changed. So the syntax for ac accessing the elements in a list is the same as for accessing the characters of a string. It's that bracket operator. Lists are mutable, meaning they can be changed. The syntax for accessing the elements of a list is the same as for accessing the characters of a string, the bracket operator. And remember that indices inside of those brackets start with a zero, zero being the first in the list or the first in the string. Up above, we created people with Jack, Jill, and James. Here, if we access zero, we get the first string in the list, which is Jack. Next, let's create a new variable called pep. It is a variety, some strings, and inside the last element, a list. Now we can pull out just one item out of the nested list. In this case, we pulled out of element three, so zero, one, two, and this is three, we pulled out item one. So, because zero and one. So out of three, we pulled out one, and that got us target. Now, remember again, unlike strings, lists are mutable. The bracket operator appears on the left side of an assignment, identifies the element of the list that will be assigned. So let's take a look. Let's start by creating numbers. And now let's change the value of one of those. So we have zero, we have one, and we have two. We're going to change the value of numbers one. And let's print that out and you'll see that now instead of 10, 20, 30, we have 10, 21, and 30. Your indices work the same way for lists as they would do for string indices. And so keep that in mind as well. Any integer expression can be used as an index. And if you want to read or write an element that does not exist, you know, if you try to go beyond the indices that's available, you're going to get an indexing error. And of course you can't, if you try to do a negative value, you're going to end up counting backwards from the end of the list. We want to use also perhaps the in operator on list because they work. We want to check now and let's see if Jill is in people, which we created above. Yes, Jill was. And if we roll scroll up, look, we will see we had people with Jack, Jill, and James. 
What about Bob? Is Bob in that list? No, so we get a false. So we can use the in operator just like we could with strings. Now, the most common way to traverse a list is with a for loop. And the syntax, again, is the same as with strings. For P and people, print hello followed by P. Let's create that, and we get hello Jack, hello Jill, and hello James. When we print out what's in people, we see it's Jack, Jill, and James. We can also use it for in, in this fashion. For num in the list, one, two, three, create num2 and set it equal to num times two, and then print num2. Creates, takes one, multiplies it by two to get two. Two times two to get four, three times two to get six, and prints those out. Now this works really well when you only need to read the elements of the list. But if you want to write or update the elements, you need to use the indices. A common way to do this is to combine the built-in functions range and len for length. We have numbers 10, 20, and 30 as a list. Now for i in the range length of numbers, because remember length of numbers is going to tell us how many elements are in the list, which in this case is going to be 3. 3 is going to be greater than the actual final index because it's going to be 0, 1, and 2 for the index of those three items. So if we use for i in range, it's going to go numbers 0 equals number 0 times 2. So here's a way to actually update what's in those indices. Now let's print it out and see. And you see that our numbers have changed from 10, 20, and 30 to 20, 40, and 60. How would we translate that above code into a function? Well, we could call it double it that takes a list called t. Here we're starting out using that policy of developing our code slowly. So we build a little bit, and then we keep adding to it. So we're going to say the definition of double it t is going to return a zero. And then we're going to call it with five, and it returns the zero. And it's a 0, 0, 0.0 float zero. We're going to now, we know we've got the syntax of that right, we're going to add to it. And we're going to add in some comments. Next, we add in com, leave the comments, and we add in our for loop here. And we put in a couple of print statements to make sure that everything works. Now let's call that double it, pass it 10, 20, and 30. And you can see that it takes 10, doubles it to 20, takes 20, doubles it to 40, takes 30, doubles it to 60, and still returns 0, 0.0. Our final step is we're going to pull out those print statements, which were our scaffolding statements here within the for loop, and we're going to stop returning 0.0, .0 and we're going to return t, the new list. So let's verify that's created. And now let's call it using our numbers 10, 20, and 30 list. And you can see that it does, in fact, do exactly what we asked. Let's try it again with a different set of numbers, and you can see it's still working just fine. We can also do operations on lists. The plus operator will concatenate two lists together. Here we have 1, 2, and 3 being concatenated with 4, 5, and 6. We have two variables a and b. We're going to concatenate those and turn them into c. And it just puts the two lists together, so we have a single list. You'll notice it doesn't modify the original list, so here's b still containing 4, 5, and 6. We can also use the operator, multiplication operator, to repeat a list a given number of times. So here we have a list of one element with a zero, and we're going to take that times six, and we get a list with six elements, and they're all identical. This one, we're going to take a list of one, two, three, take it times three, and we should get a concatenated list of 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and we do. Very useful ways of modifying using the concatenate or the repeat functionality of operators and lists. 
We can also use list slicing, and this works pretty much like it did with strings. Here we have our list. It has A, B, C, D, E, F. Now we can slice out 1, colon, 3. Remember, the 1 is included in our call, and the 3 is excluded. So we want to pull out some of the letters here. It should just pull out 2. And we're getting B and C because A is at index 0, 1, 2, 3. And 3 was excluded, so B and C come out. If we leave out the first index and go through 4, we should get 0, 1, 2, and 3's index. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3 for A, B, C. If we start at 2 and leave out the second indices, we will get through the end. So we get C, D, E, F because it's 0, 1, 2. And now we can pull the entire list out by leaving out both indices. Now a slice operator on the left side of an assignment can update multiple elements. Here's an example. We've got T1 colon 3 change in this are our two string elements. So we're going to take 0, 1, 2, 3 and replace 1 through 3, which means we're going to replace 1 and 2. 3 is excluded. So this should give us A, change this, and D, E, and F. We can now go ahead and change everything from 3 through the end and replace it with test, 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 which means we get A, change this, test, test, test. And there's what the result is. We can also use list methods when working with lists. Now, Python provides some that operate on lists, such as the append, which will add a new element to the end of the list. Here we have a list with ABC, and we're going to append D to it. And there we see our new list. Now, you can extend use extend, which will take a list as an argument and append all of the other elements. So here we have T1 and T2, and we want to extend onto T1 using T2. And we see that now we have ABC plus D and E from T2. This functionality also allows us to map, filter, and reduce. A reduce is an operation that combines a sequence of elements into a single value that is called a reduce. So you can add up all of the numbers in a list. Use, you can use this as a loop. So here we define add all, passing the list t. We set a counter called total to zero. And then for x in t, we're going to add into total itself plus x. We're using this abbreviation here. Instead of saying total equals total plus x, we say total plus equals x. And then we return total. Find our function and run our function on 1, 2, 3. And when we add those three numbers up, they do indeed equal 6. So here's what I was talking about, how we can um, take this and make it a little bit smaller, write it in a shorter way, and Python knows what to do with that. Remember that the plus sign in this instance comes before the equals. You can also add up a number of lists in a co using the common built-in function called sum because people do it so much that it's just got a built-in functionality. And you can see here, t123, using the sum function on it, gets 6 also. Sometimes you want to traverse a one list while building another. We call this mapping. So for example, the following function takes a list of strings and returns a new list that contains the capitalized strings. So here's our function being set up and designed. For capitalize all, you being past the t list, 
we create a reserve here, res, blank list. And for SNT, we're going to append to res the capitalized string. And then at the end, it will return that. So define that and run it against this is fun. And we get this is fun with capital letters on each of those individual strings in the list. Now we can also filter and the operation to select some of the elements from a list and return a sublist. That's called filtering. So here we're setting up a function that's going to only bring back uppercase elements out of the list. So again, we set up our little empty list, res, and for s in t, if s is an uppercase element, append it. And then at the end, return. So here is our function, and here's our list right now. It's a capital A, lowercase b, capital C, and we're going to call only upper on our list and we get back just the A and the C. Is upper is a string method that will return a true if the spring contains only uppercase letters. And now this is called a filter because it allows us to pull out just some of the elements and leave others out. There are also multiple ways of deleting elements in lists. One of the several methods to delete elements from a list is to use pop. Here we have a list T equals A, B, and C, and we're going to pop what's in index 1 into variable X. Now when we look at t, we no longer have what's in index 1, which was b, and that value is now in x. So it lets us pull it out of the list and save it into a variable so that we can then do something with it. If we don't need whatever we want removed from the list, we can instead use the del operator. Here, again, same list, A, B, C, but now instead of saving that value in X, we're just going to get rid of it. And when we look at T, we see that we have deleted what was in index 1. If you know the element you want to remove, but you don't know the index, you can use the remove function. Here we have our list, A, B, C. And we just want to remove the B, and that's all we know. We don't know where it is in the list. We don't really care, so we're just going to use remove. And when we look at our list, it's A and C. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind when looking at this. Pop is used as this method T period pop, so it's a dot notation with the parentheses. Delete is delete t and square brackets using the reference to the index. And then remove is another method that uses dot notation and it's followed by parentheses instead of square brackets. Now if we want to remove more than one element, we can use the delete function with the slice index. Here we have t having a, b, c, d, e, and f and we want to pull out and delete, get rid of 1 through 5. Now remember, 5 is excluded, so it's really going to be index 1, 2, 3, and 4. We see that all we're left with is index 0, two, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are gone, and index 5 remains. The A and the F, they have new index for 5 is now 1, so now it's 0 and 1. Now when it comes to lists and strings, remember a string is a sequence of characters and a list is a sequence of values. But a list of characters is not the same as a string. To convert from a string to a list of characters, you can use list. So here we have a string, test, and it's assigned to test we can convert that to a list by using the list 
functionality that is a reserved word inside of Python, so you can't use it in other ways. And when we print out T, T is the individual characters in a list. So you can break a string into individual letters, and if you want to break a string into words, maybe instead of a single word, you have a string that has multiple words in it, you can use the split method. And that will break it apart. And this one is a dot, dot notation. And when we look at it, we get this split into individual elements in a list, each of the individual words. An optional argument called a delimiter will specify which characters to use as word boundaries. Here's one using an example as a hyphen as the delimiter where we have H-E-L-L-O and we can pull those out and we get H-E-L-L-O as individual elements in our list. And the join is the inverse of split, so we can take a list of strings and concatenate the elements. It's a string method, so you know you don't you have to invoke it on the delimiter and pass it as a separate parameter. So here's our list we created earlier, T. And if we want to put that delimiter back in, we have to pass that as part of our join. When we do that, we get the one hello with dashes, we could have put the and sign, and that's a little hard to read, so how about we just put spaces? So you can pass anything you'd like here, and we could have passed an empty space so that they would show up as a word. We also have list arguments, so when you pass a list to a function, the function gets a reference to the list. If the function modifies the list, the caller sees the change. Here's an example. Uh, delete head removes the first element from a list. So here's our function, and it's going to delete index 0 from the list t. And I can pass it the list a, b, c, d. Now when I delete, it's going to delete the zero index, which was A, and I'm left with B, C, D. So it's important to distinguish between the operations that modify list and the operations that create new lists. This modified our list. Let's look at how the append method modifies a list. Here we have T1 equals 1, 2, and then T2 append equals t1.append3. You might expect that t2 is going to contain 1, 2, 3. However, it's t1 that contains 1, 2, 3, and t2 contains nothing. It returns none. So it's not changed. It's not actually created. Now let's create t3 by using the operator, the plus operator. And when we create, we created T3. So now we have T1 still having 1, 2, 3, T3 having 1, 2, 3, 4. So the result of the operation is a new list. The original list is unchanged. Now this becomes very important when you write functions that are supposed to be modifying lists. So here is an example, a function that does not delete the head of a list. We have a bad delete head function. We're trying to delete the zero index, but in fact it doesn't work. So if we pass it t4, which is 1, 2, 3, and you'll see that it still contains 1, 2, 3 because it's not pulling it out. It doesn't work that way. That's the wrong way to do it. So make sure you're not trying to do things the wrong way. Make sure you're doing it the right way. So an alternative is to write a function that creates and returns a new list. So you could pass tail or define tail of t which returns t 
1 through the end. So here's my new function. Now I'm going to pass letters A, B, C list to tail and create a new list called rest. So rest contains just from index 1 to the end, which in this case is B and C. When debugging, careless use of lists can lead to long hours of debugging. So you want to make sure that you know what's going on and what you're doing. Most list methods modify the argument and return none. This is the opposite of the string methods, which return a new string and leave the original alone. So if you're used to writing string codes, you know, you may try to do the same thing with a list and it won't work the same way. Sort in this case is going to return none. The next operation where you're trying to use the sorted version of T is probably going to fail. Another thing to keep in mind, there are so many different ways to do things. Pick an idiom and stick with it. So instead of doing things one way and then doing things a different way, stick with one way and go through and do use those same tools all the time. So here are some correct examples. To append, you can say t, your list t append x. You could say t is equal to t plus x in square brackets, and that can be shortened to t plus equals x in square brackets. These ways are wrong. Okay, up here the append gets the parentheses where these got square brackets. Both together are not going to work. If you do this and append, it doesn't work. If you try to append and assign, it doesn't work. T plus a square bracket doesn't work. T equals T plus X without square brackets doesn't work. So make sure you understand the functionality and the syntax of each of them as you go through. Sometimes you will get a runtime error, sometimes you will just get the wrong result and not know why. Making copies to avoid aliasing. If you want to use a method that, like sort that modifies an argument, but you need to keep the original list as well, you can make a copy. So here's our original t. It's equal to 3, 1, 2. And we're going to make T2, which is T all-inclusive. Then we're going to use the sort function on T2. So T should be the same as it was originally. T2 is now a sorted version of T. In this next example, you could use the built-in function sorted, which returns a new sorted list and leaves the original alone. So I could say T2 equals a sorted T. T is going to be the same. T2 is now the sorted version. If you have any questions, please consult your professor.